I would want you to understand what we mean by information molecules, and then I will introduce some basic concepts from the self-assembly supramolecular field, uh, talk about hydrogen bonds and cooperativity, and then a little bit about the systems I've been working on, so the information oligoesters. So what are information molecules? Well, we define them as sort of oligomeric chains, polymeric chains, or information in, uh, molecules in general, but can write information in a sequence of some sort of recognition units. So for example, in the case of uh, nucleic acids, that would be the four canonical nucleotide bases that have some sort of function and are embedded in the chain in a sequence specific way. They could then be read, for example, by the complementary bases, the way the Watson-Crick base pairing works, and the information could be copied, for example, in the case of DNA through some sort of polymerase reactions where you template one strand into the other strand. So that sort of copying always carries some error, so could lead to evolution of the molecule, material, whatever that is. So biochemists have done a lot of things, and they showed that no matter what you change in the DNA scaffold, in most cases it still is able to form the duplex, the duplex that you want. So you can postulate easily that there is not much speci specificity in the exact structure of all of the building blocks of the modules that come into the DNA. So in general, when you have a monomer that has, or well, I can actually use that as a pointer, but has a backbone part to which, or maybe not, to which you attach the recognition unit and has some sort of synthetic bits that will join them together, you can get from monomer to oligomer with a sequence of pending side chains, recognition units, and those can recognize each other in solution and form a duplex. The kind of most common force to recognize molecules and form duplexes would be hydrogen bonding. You might have heard about that at school. Uh, hydrogen bonds are basically formed between the positive, the blue part, and negative, the red part, potential on a molecule. And in this case here, that is acetic acid, so common vinegar could be anything else, water, alcohol, etc. Uh, and acetic acid forms dimers, so it forms this closed species with two acetic acid molecules kind of in solution, and that's pretty cool because given its molecular weight, you would expect the uh, boiling point of acetic acid to be somewhat half of what it actually is observed, so that co kind of correlates with the double mass you observe of it. But why are those hydrogen bonds so strong? I mean, normally when you learn at school, a hydrogen bond is a very weak force. Well, they act in a cooperative fashion, or how we call it, or to be more precise, chelate cooper cooperative. So from Greek, kele, or something like that, means a claw, like in a lobster, so they act together. Uh, so in this case, you have two molecules, we call them bidentate because they have two teeth through which they interact. They have two molecules that have two acceptor sites and two donor sites. And the very first interaction you have between those two molecules will be intermolecular in principle. So basically, you have two molecules in solution, they come together, they meet, that is intermolecular. And then the second interaction to zip up this molecule and form a closed dimer, closed duplex, is intramolecular. So now, if you remember from school, the concentration of sub or products over concentration of substrates is an association constant. Uh, and if the association constant to form a hydrogen bond is something like K, um, the, con the association constant to form the second one will be that K multiplied by something we would call effective molarity. And as the name suggests, it's basically the sort of effective concentration of the second binding site on the molecule once the reaction is no longer intermolecular but intramolecular. So basically, that is the factor that changes how stronger the complex is if we close things that are together rather than separately flying in solution. So overall, the complex is stronger than some of the isolated bonds because they act cooperatively, so they act together. All right, so we can now imagine we have an oligomer, as we pointed out earlier, that has a sequence of acceptor and donor sites. For simplicity, I just color coded them as red being acceptor and blue being donor. And when you have an oligomer like that, a chain, 
they can associate in whatever different ways. So you can imagine if we follow that, I'm not sure which of these works. Now, if you follow that first association, you, f you bring these two molecules together, and now there are different processes that could be going on. If you have a lot of these molecules around, you can form random oligomeric networks, and that's not cool, so we work at low concentrations. Um, or you can either have two sides next to each other that will zip up like that, which is not particularly exciting, or two sides that zip up like this. So the one, two interactions between neighboring sides we would call folding or one, two folding, and that will be governed by the effective molarity of folding. And the second one, if you zip up along the chain, that will be giving you a duplex. So we'll call that the effective molarity of duplex formation. And the important factor is whether the effective molarity of folding is bigger than the effective molarity of duplex and whether we form closed duplexes or one, two folded chains that can't really do anything. Because what these molecules could do, I mean, we have a lot of recognition sites, and as Pavel showed earlier, uh, a lot of recognition sites on a molecule can bring molecules together and can lead to some sort of catalysis. So that's what nucleic acids do often, especially single-stranded. So to put that in perspective, these are molecules that, well, these sort of simple blueprint molecules that could do what nucleic acids do, evolve, catalyze different reactions and do something cool or give fa fan fancy materials. So if they fold in this one, two fashion, that's boring because they can't really do anything because all of these recognition sites are already preoccupied doing things, folding on themselves. So we need to check whether they fold or form duplexes. And I synthesized some things. Uh, that is the only bit of chemistry I'm showing you. So I synthesized molecules that you can see have a donor, so that is the, the phenol, um, let's see if that works. The phenol site here is the donor, and the phosphenoxide site here is the acceptor. So using our previous nomenclature, the molecule here on the left is a DD dimer, and the one on the right will be AA, two acceptors dimer, and that binds somewhat, quite strongly. And if you look into the table, it binds more or less 100 times more strongly than if we didn't have the two sites next to each other, which basically means they have to act cooperatively. So we sort of know already that uh, they form uh, hydrogen bonds and closed duplexes. Uh, all of the other data here is for those interested, uh, just basically to show that both the donor sites and the acceptor sites show very strong change in the magnetic field they feel upon these molecules coming together, which basically means that they both are involved in bonding. So it's not really the AA chain doing something and the DD chain being somewhere else. They, are, they do come together and do form a closed duplex. Similarly, the AD chain and the DA chain, they do come together as well. They self-associate, it's a self-complementary chain. And again, you can see that this binding constant here is much greater than the one for isolated hydrogen bonds. So it has to come cooperatively and there is no folding observed, uh, which is cool because that can lead to some potentially functional materials. And for those of you who know anything about chemistry, these two monomers are joined by an ester linkage. So these bonds here. Not sure how many of you know what esters are, uh, but hopefully enough of you know that polyesters are probably the most abundant po polymeric material ever. So most of us are wearing clothes made of polyesters now. So esters are simple to synthesize, which is the key concept here, because if you want something that is to become a material, you need to make sure that it's easy to actually be made, rather than something super crazy fancy that takes 100 years and five PhD students to finish. So we know that for the tumors or dimers, whatever you want to call them, we do nicely follow this channel that we start from oligomers and they form a duplex. It is a pretty short duplex, but it is a duplex anyway. What would happen if we made the molecules bigger and larger? And I lied to you because there's a second part of chemistry. So I made a molecule that we could call an ADAD tetramer, uh, which is already a somewhat more interesting chain. It has a lot of possible ways it can assemble with itself. Uh, and because it is basically like a palindromic nucleic acid sequence, a very short one, but still palindromic nucleic acid sequence, uh, we kind of call these possible assemblies the way you would call them being molecular biologists or structural biologists, because we could have a denatured strand of an ADAD chain that could fold onto itself in the back, forming a stem loop, and those can associate. 
like, a kissing like the kissing interactions in nucleic acids, or we could form a duplex, or we could form something else. We already know they will not form these useless one, two folded things, because the backbone is exactly the same as what it was earlier, so we can rule that out. And indeed, they do something cool. So what this experiment here shows is so-called melting experiment. So basically, we have a solution of the ADAD self-complementary palindromic nucleic acid-like sequence of an information molecule with hydrogen bond donors and acceptors in the chain, and we heat it up. Well, we cool it down first, and then we heat it up. And we see how it behaves. So the red trace on the top is the corresponding melting curve for the AD. So the previous tumor that we had, which is also self-complementary, and we know it does this. The green trace is the melting of the two inner donors of the AD ch AD, AD chain. So AD, AD has the AD in it, and we basically see that the middle ADs behave like in the tumor. So they do prob probably, I mean, there are other experiments that rule things out. So just conclusion-wise, they probably associate like that. But what we do see as well is that the blue trace, so the bottom one, which is the outermost A and D, they behave somewhat differently. They have a much higher melting temperature. They form much stronger bonds. So what could be happening and what makes sense is that those two outermost A and D bases fold in the sort of one four way, forming a very short stem loop with two base bases sticking out. And those later associate the way very similar to what the AD dimers were doing. So basically, what we observe is that there is a simple oligomeric chain, very easy to synthesize, based on simple standard ester coupling chemistry, with hydrogen bonding groups, which are basically recognition units similar in function to what DNA has in its chain, somewhat different in structure, but functionally similar. Uh, and they do mimic what DNA does. I mean, DNA actually doesn't, but RNA, uh, I believe, does that uh, in viruses and other things. So that's actually pretty cool, and hopefully will lead to some sort of functional materials. So to, to quickly summarize, we synthesize building blocks for, informations, for information molecules, so molecules that read, write, and copy information, but can be easily synthesized and scalable. Uh, we observe that they do form closed duplexes without folding, and we do observe that their longer chain behavior resembles what RNA would have, been, would have done, which is pretty cool. So to kind of leave you with a final high thought synthetic chemistry slide, uh, which we start with um, two monomers, so basically building blocks for a polymer with, a ester, uh, with, a, with an alcohol and acid protected. We can easily form esters, and when we form longer esters that contain information, their emerging behavior appears, and they do something cool, the way uh, biology does something cool. So hopefully we can use those for evolving materials or uh, catalysis of things or whatever else you can imagine. And the cool thing is they're soluble in organic solvents, which is exactly complementary to DNA, which is soluble in water. So thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank my supervisor, Professor Chris Hunter, and all of the group for support throughout my PhD, the ERC for funding, and all of the various Cambridge-based organizations that gave me money as well. So if you have any questions, I would be happy to try and answer. Great, thank you very much.